Ok, allons-y. <laughs> Hello, Nate. Good morning, or good evening in your case. Um, how are you doing? Uh, so I'm in Hong Kong, you're in the US. Uh, you're Nate Hagen, so I've been trying to, to talk to you for a while. I've been reading a lot of about, about what you've been writing. I'm quite impressed by it. So I'm pleased uh, to, to have you on Sismic. Um, can you, yeah, can, can you, can you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, what you do, what you write, what you're busy doing, basically? Uh, yeah, so I used to be in finance. Um, I worked on Wall Street and about almost 20 years ago, I started to figure out, uh, that our economy is based on extraction of natural resources. We don't pay for the pollution nor the creation of those resources. We only pay for the extraction. Uh, and that there were a lot of flaws in our economic system. Uh, I also realized that the change in our culture and our way of life was going to happen during my lifetime. And so I quit. I gave my clients their money back. And for the last 18 years, I've been um, putting together, dismantling, re-putting together the systems uh, synthesis of the human predicament. How does everything fit together? Because we're part of a system. Human behavior, who we are as evolved animals, uh, economics, natural resources, particularly energy, money, uh, economic system, ecology, the environment, other species, and, and how that, uh, combines to give a coherent picture, <clears throat> both of our situation and, and possible pathways. So I work mostly on that. I've spent the last 15 years putting together this story of, of the superorganism, which I know uh, you've read. And now I'm working mostly not on describing the problem, but on describing possible pathways forward. Yeah, so, you know, Sismic is, um, this podcast is a podcast in which I, I talk to people that can help us making sense of fast, of that fast changing world and making sense of what is at stake in the coming years. So I think we have a lot to discuss here. And, um, I'd like to start with your own worldview, you know, as an individual and, and how you, th how you like to think in system, as you just said. How do you look at the world today? What are the different lenses? You just mentioned a little bit, but I would like to dig, to go a little bit deeper into this. What are the lenses, the different glasses that you are using to to try to make sense of what's going on? Like, can can we go a little bit into this? Right. Well, the first one is is uh, energy and uh, the economy. Um, right now, we uh, use a lot of fossil hydrocarbons, and people just look at those as the same as they would a, a coffee cup or uh, a computer or something like that, but Energy underpins our productivity in our world. And right now we use the equivalent of a hundred billion barrels of coal oil and natural gas per year, which works out to 500 billion human workers. So one of my lenses is that much of our economic wealth and riches and goods and services today is because of this one time carbon pulse of the last two centuries we've been basing our economy on massive resource extraction. Another lens is the environmental lens. Uh, we're approaching a sixth mass extinction. Um, we're driving a lot of populations as opposed to species uh, extinct. Um, you know, we're losing insect biomass at 2% a year. Uh, the oceans are acidifying. So there's, uh, we're privatizing the benefits of our economic system and we're socializing and putting on the environment the costs of our economic system so that the environment is another lens. And probably the most important lens in my work that I think about is that humans are evolved organisms and we go through our days not trying to have a lot of babies or not trying to have a big bank account. We're actually, those are our proximate explanations of our behavior. The ultimate explanations of our behavior is we're trying to get the same emotional states of our successful ancestors. So we go through our day, uh, with a modern technology, but with a stone age, a stone age mind and uh, so we get dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and endocrine cascades in a novel environment. 
And there's both bad news and good news in that. And the bad news is that we're wired to compare ourselves to others. And in a culture that promotes ostentatious displays of wealth and conspicuous consumption and comparison of others on pecuniary metrics, this is a real problem because people in the developing nations are trying to aspire to be like people in France or the United States. The good news is that we don't need all that stuff uh, to be happy and healthy uh, because our, our ancestral uh, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, we were in small tribes. And so our, our real core being is social capital, not all this stuff. Uh, so the third lens would be the human behavior lens, because we don't really have an environmental or uh, uh, an energy or an economic problem. Those problems stem from a human brain behavior mismatch in our modern world. Okay. So I, I think what we'll do also is to try to go into this topic one by one to, to make sure that we can cover all the things that you mentioned in detail and understand, you know, how this is built. Um, but I, I would like to start from what you mentioned earlier, which is what you call the, the human predicament, which is, that is by definition, you know, an unpleasant predicament for those who don't know is an unpleasant situation that is difficult to get out of. So what is what is it? What is that unpleasant, unpleasant situation that we are in? And what are these different components of that situation, the predicament? Right. So first of all, I use the word predicament as opposed to problem because a problem has a solution. A predicament has a series of options. Some would be less bad, some would be bad, um, but it doesn't really have a solution. Um, so the predicament now <clears throat> is we have 7.8 billion humans, um, most of which are following an economic system based on growth. And the growth requires natural resources, particularly low cost uh, energy and materials. And every year we create money, but we don't create interest. And so the economic uh, institutions that we have were designed during a novel uh, period of massive economic growth because we just access this giant uh, amount of, of fossil sunlight in, in the form of coal, oil, natural gas. So all of our expectations and our institutions and our government is based on the idea that growth continues upward over time as if it were some natural law. Well, it's only a natural law if we have ample energy resources and environmental sinks. And now um, the last 20 years or so, we've already faced social limits to growth. Look at the, the yellow vest movement in, in France um, where the pie has been getting bigger, but the pie has been mostly going to the top 10% wealthiest uh, humans. And we, we don't have enough organic growth to continue growing the pie for everyone. So there's both a physical limit and a distribution limit and an environmental limit, as we mentioned earlier. And so the, the predicament is we have plenty of energy to provide for human needs. The average American uses 100 times more energy than our bodies need. In Europe, it's like 50 or 60 times more. So it's not like we're really running out of resources. We're just running out of resources that are affordable to give us the current lifestyles that we have. Uh, so the predicament really is how do we, in a humane way, move towards a lower growth paradigm and the, the, our human behavior, a very long list of human behavioral traits will make us not recognize that and not publicly talk about it because it's complex, it's threatening, it's abstract, it's in the future, there are no immediate solutions. So we defer and we suppress it. Um, so how do we in advance prepare strategies, lifeboats, speed bumps, airbags to arrive at a, a safer, um, a more peaceful, uh, stable state. That's the predicament. Yeah. And before we go into, I hope we're going to have 
we will have time to go into these uh, um, these potential solutions or you know ways to adapt. I would like to to stay a bit more on 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 what you just said regarding the the growth because when we listen to our politicians and most of our leaders, you know, today, we are basically under the impression that. Yes, there there are challenges to face. You know, everyone recalls that, but that everyone is still fine with a growing uh, global economy, right? And we see this right now. Uh, Post COVID nineteen, the priority is to go back to normal. That is to go to go back to a growing economy, right? And and that this is what we should hope for. You know, since economical growth is needed to develop the world, is needed to address human development issues and to continue to progress as, as a civilization. You know, that's the, that's the most common belief that we have. This is what we've been taught. C- can we go into this um, widely shared belief that growth is what is needed and, and what is desirable and what will happen you know, and why you believe that is not actually going to happen? Yeah. Um, first of all, Part of the reason that this, all this stuff isn't more widely understood and widely discussed is because, as you've mentioned on your podcast, it's not a simple story. It's incredibly complex, and you have to put all the pieces together to understand it, and ecology and human behavior are at the core of it. So on the one hand, the human system of 8 billion people pursuing their own self-interest getting their brain chemicals in a novel environment all require energy. So there's a metabolism of our system as a whole that is divorced from our intentions or our wishes to be sustainable or to have something other than growth. Growth for many people actually is necessary because they are in abject poverty. They have to walk 10 miles a day to get water and they need a little bit more and they need the carrot that they can live like people in France. Um, so growth, uh, actually for people in the bottom two thirds of society is a good thing. Growth at the top to buy a yacht or to go on a fancy trip or these things doesn't really translate into human well being or human happiness. But in aggregate, here's the problem, is that humans are a biological uh, organism collectively. I call it a super organism. And in nature, you can measure the energetic use uh, of an organism by its mass to the three-quarter power. So there is a stable relationship in nature between mice and elephants and whales that depending on their size, you can predict how much energy they use. So part of this is um, a predetermined momentum of global society that if we are functioning uh, without constraints, that we will use, continue to use a certain amount of energy. Right now, the world uses, uh, or as of the end of 2019, 17 terawatts continuously, 17 trillion watts of energy continuously. And so we can't just say, ah, Let's stop that. I think what's going to happen is it's going to stop because of limits to uh, credit debt, using money to paper over our, our, um, our economic wants. And then we're going to have a window, and I think that window is in the next few years, to hopefully design a system that we base our goals on something other than GDP. GDP stands for gr- uh, gross domestic product. And if you aggregate it all over the world, it's gross world product. And basically, uh, Julian, it's a measure simply of how much energy we burn. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like 99% correlated with how much energy we burn. And we need to move beyond that. Yeah. And there the are, if you, if you look for it, you know, it's very easy to find, um, very interesting graphs. W- that show the direct correlation correlation there is between how much energy is being extracted, how much oil is being extracted, and economical growth, right? It's as simple as that. So you could argue that the richest country uh, with the biggest GDP is the one that is burning the most you know, fuel, or meaning that it has access to the most fuel. But why... Why do you think, you know, why do you think this is not well understood? 
Um, because once you understand that, and I, honestly, I, I just recently understood it, like just a few years ago, once you understand that, it totally changes one's perspective on the economy and on the future of all, because we know that also we're running out of uh, of easy, accessible oil on which we depend, right? And how come it's, it seems that no one within the business world or politics is is taking this seriously? You know, it's looked like, um, I, I really don't get it. Maybe you have a, a take on it. Yeah, I, I do have a take on it. I used to work in business. Uh, I have a master's in finance and I still talk to a lot of my business school colleagues. Most everyone, especially in business schools, view the world in a monetary lens that human demand and human uh, inventiveness create our productivity. So most people in the business world are what I refer to as energy blind. They do not see that uh, that one barrel of oil, which right now is $20, does almost five years of yours or my physical work, over $100,000 or much more than that, actually. They don't think of that because they only think of it costs $20. They only think of the cost. They don't think of the 10 or 100 million years it took to develop that oil or the, the uh, externalities of its pollution. They just think about its cost. But is it, is, it, is it a flow in the basic economical equation or, you know, like is it the fact that economists don't have an engineered background? It's it's first of all, it's a fundamental flaw in macroeconomics. They okay. misunderstand uh, how our productivity is uh, generated. They they think it's all capital and labor. But in, in reality, and there's been a lot of biophysical uh, research on this lately. In reality, uh, labor and capital are dependent variables and they're both dependent on energy. Um, the other, the other thing is the famous Upton Sinclair quote that you can, from the, the 1930s book, The Jungle. You can't, uh, expect a man to understand something that his job depends on him not understanding. Because if we don't have growth and if we have the scarcity that not everyone will be able to consume at the level today, that's a phase shift in people's minds and it's very threatening. And so they rather don't talk about it. But here's a fascinating thing. I, you tell me if this is happening in, in France or in Hong Kong. When I re, when I talk to high level, uh, CEO or, uh, politician one on one over some beer, um, they agree with me. But when they go to their public position, they don't agree with me. So I think there's a certain uh, taboo about articulating the things I'm saying to you on this podcast in the public. Because could you imagine if Macron would say, we have limits to growth, our society is very rich uh, relative to our ancestors, relative to our descendants, but we're going to have to structure a so society that everyone in France for the next 10 or 20 years has to consume 40 to 50% less. He would not be elected. Well, I, I guess, uh, I mean, we're speculating here, but I guess since uh, um, if you explain the reality of things and you say it's based on on physics and on, it would be, wouldn't it be more accepted than uh, that you know con that myth that we we keep. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure that in France you know people will kind of read about it and try to understand it. And if it's explained clearly, that would be that could be understood. Maybe I'm wrong, but so you think they don't talk about it because they think that first of all it's 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 too long term and it's not in their interest to talk about it right now, and also that people wouldn't understand. I, I think the. Um... I think the core part is psychological, actually. It's not intellectual. Uh, for instance, um, I was talking over the holidays to one of my conservative uncles about climate change. We had a couple hours together and I explained to him piece by piece that carbon is uh, a green, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and that we're emitting it 10 million times faster than it was sequestered, and this has impacts. And he was like, yes, oh my gosh, that's a very clear understanding. Now I get it. So what do we do about it? And I said, well, we have to use less because what we're using is emitting carbon. And once I explained to him the solutions, 
or the possible solutions. All of a sudden, he went back and he was like, wait a minute. Denial. I'm not sure I agree with this climate change <laughs> thing. So it's once we, we, we understand the problem, yeah. it's easy to understand. And then what are the solutions? Then it's too cognitively painful to, to okay. fathom that. So I think if we had a pathway that lots of people would understand and collectively engage with, then the conversation would would start to be m- more real. And you know what? The the world is week by week catching up to the story that we're discussing. Yeah, yeah. Reality, you know, check. Even though I think we we're very good in uh, denying reality, and we could we can go back into this when we talk about you know behavior in in the brain on, on the energy. Um, <clears throat> what does it mean? You know, so that we are aligned on this. What does it mean? for the mostly talked about energy transition, you know, or Green New Deal. Can we hope that new energy sources, hopefully, you know, cleaner, okay, like solar or, you know, like wind power can compensate the end of fossil fuel and allow us to continue to grow? And and, and by the way, there is there another way to grow the economy that doesn't necessarily depend so much on energy, you know, so like some people say, like knowledge economy or this type of concept? Yeah, see, this is why doing these 60 or 90 minute podcasts is, uh, it's not really sufficient because you have like five questions in what you just asked me and all of them are really central. First of all, if we truly want to grow an economy, you cannot grow it with knowledge. Uh, we can grow our experiences and our well being and we might be able to shift to such an economy. But right now, GDP, the growth of an economy that actually gives goods and services to people around the world is absolutely dependent on energy. There is a very tight coupling of energy and GDP, not in the United States, not in the United Kingdom, because we have a lot more services, but we import in the, in the United States, the average American consumes 57 barrels worth of oil equivalent of the main fossil fuels every year. And we consume another 15 to 20 on things that were built in China uh, or overseas that we import. So uh, the world economy as a whole is absolutely tethered to energy use. That's number one. Your second question was about um, the Green New Deal. And you asked, can we continue to grow using renewable energy? Well, first of all, renewable energy is not renewable. The sun and the wind are renewable. The devices that we build to harness the sun and the wind are no more renewable than a pickup truck. They are rebuildable, not renewable. Um, so the other problem is most of the renewable sources are only, uh, produce electricity. And right now about 20% of our energy use is electricity. The rest is transportation and heating and things like that. Then there's the problem of intermittence and all of these things can somewhat be solved. But the biggest problem that I see is that, um, since we have these flaws in macroeconomic theory about the real drivers of growth, We see these fantastically delusional plans where we can continue to grow the economy out to 2050 and also have zero fossil carbon use, which is completely delusional, number one. Number two is that all of our institutional plans are based on market forces making the best decisions for society. So right now, we are trying to solve climate change by adding renewables to the system in the hopes that eventually the fossil carbon will deplete and renewables will go up. Well, first of all, fossil carbon underpins the creation of these renewable devices. But more importantly is we're just building a bigger system. So in last year, the amount of electricity demand in the world just from 2018 to 2019 the increase in demand alone was greater than all of the solar voltaics put in since the beginning of when they were invented so we are growing renewable sources quite rapidly but until this covid crisis we're growing our demand for total energy total consumption greater so to solve climate change This will not happen by using renewables. What we really need to do, though, is not say renewables are worthless or not say that renewables are our savior, 
but to have a plan where we use some portion of renewables to uh, uh, extend our ability to create, invent, design new technology in tandem with our remaining seed corn, which is the remaining uh, oil and natural gas. But that's not happening. The market is not planning for that. And what's happening now with the COVID crisis is energy, natural gas and oil are so cheap that um, it's going to disincentivize the addition of future renewables and it's going to accelerate the decline rate of oil and natural gas. Because if oil right now is $20 in the United States uh, and probably is going to be lower in the future because I expect our economy is going to continue to suffer because <clears throat> of the virus, there, there's going to be a massive decline in upstream investment. So we're not going to be drilling new wells uh, like was planned. And so what ends up happening is what's called the legacy decline rate, which if you add up all the oil fields in the world, they're declining at around 6% a year. And you build on top of that the new wells and they offset that. But now there's not going to be many new wells. So that 6% decline rate accelerates. So my prediction is that 2018 October will be uh, in the rearview mirror. That will be the peak in global oil production. And the next five years, we're going to have a sharp drop in oil because we can't afford it. So many people around the world aren't traveling, aren't doing things. So we're going to have a much less oil supply because we have less demand for it. And, and, and therefore, price is going up at some point which is at some like, point but not for a, not for quite a while i don't yeah, think yeah. because yeah yeah because I mean, we were at 100 we were at 100 million barrels a day and now we're dropped 30 percent so there are there are yeah hundreds and hundreds of tankers in the ocean full of oil floating around with nowhere to put it so that means to to finish on energy also and, and on growth and then we can talk about other aspects of your of how you look at things um you know, when you look at the Paris Agreement um, and, and the way the global community looks at the climate change issue and the climate change challenge, and we say, okay, we are gonna, we are going to, uh, we have this target basically of decreasing the, the, our emissions by, you know, 5 6% a year uh, so that we can be carbon neutral in, uh, in 30 years. And you see that nothing is actually, you know, happening because we keep emitting. We keep. We still need more energy if we want to grow. And also, when you read the the Paris Agreement report, you realize that we are supposed to be decreasing our emissions, but not decreasing our economy. So, again, yeah. you know, like how how could all these people, experts, uh, politicians? You know, sign an agreement that is inherently false, or is it false? You know, or, or are, we, are we missing something? You already mentioned it, but just to link it back to the climate change challenge that we have. Yeah, this is a huge story, Julian. Um, if we take a bird's eye perspective, climate change, ocean acidification are the single biggest challenges of our era, for sure. But to our brains, they're not. To our brains, it's our jobs and our lifestyle and our safety and our security for the next couple of years or even weeks. That's what shouts loudly to our brains. So all those politicians you talk about, if they get all the way up the, the, the curve to be the senior leaders of the G20 or at the Paris Climate Talks, it, they cannot voice the words well. Uh, we're not going to be able to grow uh, because once they voice that, it, there's a phase shift in how countries will interact with each other. Who will get access to what's left if there's scarcity? So there's this unspoken uh, um, cognitive block with politicians um, that we have to con include growth in our, our assumptions. Now, climate change I'm very worried about it, but I've never been as worried as many people in the environmental community because I've known that just like a cheetah chases a gazelle and there's an energy investment and an energy revenue from the prey is that our, the amount of fossil hydrocarbons we have under the ground, we'll never be able to access all of them because of the cost. 
So this is a, a biophysical story from the start. And I would say that right now, there's, a, in my opinion, an 80% chance that emissions from commerce, maybe not total emissions, but emissions from human commerce peaked in 2019. And so many of those scenarios that the IPCC has, has uh, carbon uh, use going up 600% from now until 2100 that ends in some of the, what's called the RCP 8.5 scenario, completely delusional because it doesn't integrate energy systems in this, this bottoms up way. So I think, um, the, the, the good news is that I, I think we don't have the amount of carbon that, uh, some of the climate, uh, community thinks. The bad news is we're not going to have economic growth and we're not going to choose that. We're going to have to respond to it. Look at what is happening now. This is a mm -hmm. precursor. And so my opinion is we have to, in the next couple months, we have to save the system because, and this, you know, this is a whole nother topic of, of yeah. debt and credit, but we have to save the system in the next few months. And if we do, then we have a limited time, a few years, um, before the debt to GDP ratio becomes absolutely untenable. And then we have to, the, the answer to climate change has never been about building renewables. The answer to climate change is system change, where we have to have a different global organizing economy away from GDP. But I don't think that'll happen by us just sitting around and voting for it. We have to experience a crisis like we are now to realize and, and be educated about how the pieces fit together um, and, and maybe move towards something um, more sane and more sustainable. So, yeah, I, I think we can go back later to what we're going through right now and uh, how you look at the economical issues and the debt thing and how you link it back to... Uh, to this, how you, you you mention it, you mention that another core pillar of your own system of analysis is human behavior, right? So I would like to talk a little bit more about this. Why do you think human behavior is is part of the predicament, and what are the different ways of looking at that problem between the uh, the brain, maybe the culture, the different things? Yeah. So. Um... There's, there's many, there's many different aspects of this. We've but, got time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of them have to do with why we consume so much and why we're in this uh, biophysical situation. And some of them have to do with our, our, our inability to understand or address these issues. So I'll speak to both of them. Uh, on the first side is... Um, As biological organisms, we uh, execute optimal foraging algorithms, just like a, a, an insect or an am animal or a bird. We try to invest a little and get a lot. Now, in our ancestral environment, we only had endosomatic consumption. Endosomatic is how many calories we eat in our bodies. So we were tribal hunter-gatherers. And we worked 20 hours a week to get uh, some uh, uh, antelope and some berries and things like that. And then we sang and played and told stories and took naps. Um, we didn't have any external possessions because we had to move around a lot. So we were very, um, the, our wealth was very equal. But our status was not. There was always someone who had a higher status, whether because they were a better storyteller or more good looking or a better hunter, there was a higher status. So one of our drives as biological organisms is relative fitness, relatively comparing yourself to others. And in a culture that's not based on stories, or how good of a farmer you are, but it's based on your bank account and how long your yacht is, uh, or things like, or which kind of shoes you wear. We, this relative comparison goes crazy exponential and in a global consumption because everyone has advertisements and tries to compete with the people around them. While we forget that on an absolute basis, most of us are incredibly rich versus all of our ancestors and all of our descendants. So it's this relative drive for more. 
uh, is, is a big part of human behavior. The other thing is that when you have something, that doesn't feel as strong as when you want something. I'll give you an example. I love to um, go looking for uh, uh, fossils and uh, agates, which are these really pretty rocks. And I'll go to a river and I'll look for two hours and I'm just enjoying myself and mm, boring, 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 an agate. And I get all excited. And I love that feeling. But now in my garage, I have four giant buckets full of these agates that I never even look at. They're just sitting there like I don't even know what I'm doing with them. So it's the act of wanting. It's the act of purchasing. When you get a new pair of shoes or something like that, that is the peak in dopamine. And then after you've worn the shoes a couple of times, you have them, but you yeah. want something else. It's so like, it's the, like uh, the philosopher Spinoza says, you know, desire is the engine of, uh, of life, right? Exact them all. So uh, that's number two. Um, number three is that we're incredibly social as a species. We're what's called ultra social, which is that we collaborate with other humans towards goals of surplus. So imagine if 7.8 billion humans were like leopards, where we were solitary creatures and we only kept to ourselves. We would never have built this massive, complex civilization because what we do is we self-organize as families, as small businesses, as corporations, as nations, and we collaborate towards a goal. And the goal right now in our culture is economic growth. It does not have to be that. But right now it is. So if you add up all those things, we've become this consumptive machine. Now, the other side of things is why we, the other side of human behavior is why we don't address the issues that you and I are talking about. Well, first of all, we have something called a time bias or a steep discount rate, which is a discount rate is how much you value the present over the future. And as biological organisms, we massively care about the present versus the future. And especially if you're addicted uh, or busy or stressed about money or any of these things, scientists have shown that you care more about the future even even more than the average person. So we're, we're biologically predisposed to really care about the present, not these longer term issues. But here's another aspect why we don't address these. So uh, you're in Hong Kong. So imagine a giant fish flying above the city of Hong Kong that's purple and it has green wings like a dragonfly and it scoops down and eats a buses in Hong Kong. Any bus that's white, it eats them. <laughs> so you've never heard that before. And none of your listeners have ever heard that combination. But every one of you imagined that in your brain because I, another human, just used those words. So the human brain has the ability to imagine millions of times more concepts than actually exist in reality. And so human language is incredibly powerful. But if we're not scientifically trained in energy, ecology, human behavior, biophysical economics, there ends up being so many delusional possibilities uh, in the news, in the media, like we build a highway made out of solar panels, which is just not possible to do in, in an energy uh, um, positive way. So what ends up happening is many in our culture just hear a story about fake news that's, is, or a conspiracy theory on why the coronavirus was caused or, or things like that. And, and we just believe it because it makes sense. So that, that's another problem. And then the other problem is that these concepts are difficult to consider because the answers are uncomfortable. In the human brain, there's something called homeostasis, which is our physical uh, bodily process. Keep us stable when we're warm, uh, when we're cold, we shiver, uh, things like that. But there's also psychological homeostasis. And when we hear a scary story, we usually have two reactions to it. Number one is we will deny it. That's not possible. Technology will solve it. Um, this can't possibly be true. I'm not hearing it from any of my friends. Or 
we hear, oh my God, Zutalor, that is a terrible story. And I'm really, uh, we're screwed. There's nothing we can do. And both of those reactions to the human brain are, are linked to psychological homeostasis where we, um, we feel like we don't have to do anything. So it's comfortable for us to have those views. There's no problem or there's nothing we can do. The truth is in the middle. It's we're going to have a struggle. We're going to have to do things about this. We're going to have to sacrifice some of our conveniences and comfort. We're going to have to take a leadership role in doing things. And so all those things uh, make us feel uncomfortable, uh, which is why they don't happen. So the, the, that's just a very brief overview of some of the reasons why why human behavior is central to to our problems. How do we change that? And, and is it changeable? Because uh, I've met some people who argue that all what's happening now was kind of written since the beginning. You know, we since we went out of the forest and started to uh, to, to do this because we have this in our brain as a species, which is the capacity to deny somehow reality because we build all these stories you know we tell stories and this is what differentiates us from other species now this is one of the the theory the theory of uh, uh of Yuval Harari for example in Sapiens how do we can we do differently and if this is about telling us another story or or beating our brain or natural brain can this be done you know, and um, and I've got another. There's two questions, and I've got another questions related to if this is feasible. How do we change the culture, and how do we change the rules of the game? Because one of the, for example, if we say, okay, uh, GDP is not the good indicator, we have to change that. We have to think long term. Either we do this globally, all at the same time, or. If, if, if one country does it, you know, it loses in the game that we are in. So, you know, so how do you do that? Yeah. Okay. So the first question, uh, the answer to both of your questions is I don't know, but I have some ideas. I understand the questions quite well. I don't know the answers, but it's clear to me that humans are much more egalitarian than our current society dictates. And it's also clear to me that we are primarily socially motivated, not consumption motivated. So I think the the physical math of it is there's many, many trajectories this century that are still viable and possible. Politically and human behavior wise, there's giant hurdles. But I'm a big believer in emergence where you add one and one and sometimes it can be more than than two because of some unknown property that you couldn't expect. And so I think there are going to be lots of examples of people living differently and most of them might end up badly and some of them will end up pretty good and one or two of them might be unbelievably i want to live like them they're really cool they're healthy happy they're using less why can't we be like them so i i think there are many possibilities given how so here's the other thing we talk about overpopulation there uh this year there will be uh 80 million new human babies uh that weigh eight pounds each But this year, there will be 100 million new cars that weigh 3,000 pounds each. So is it really a population limit problem or is it an overconsumption problem? So I I really don't think that we have hard resource limits and that opens up a lot of possibilities. Now, to your second question, I agree with you. I I think we kind of have to have a global uh, convergence on 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 a new economic goal, because if one country did it, like you say, and all the other countries continue on the other way, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. And the other thing is, is if one country is shrinking and the others are growing, the people in the shrinking country are not going to want to shrink. So we have to kind of all do that together, which is going to require some sort of global cooperation, which I can't see right now, but I can see it when we decline in a situation like this, that new ideas are popping up and people understand that all that flying around and consuming wasn't making me happy. And I'm actually spending a lot of time with my family and on walks 
And so I think the real answer is, here, here's the problem and, and one direction. The problem is right now with this coronavirus, people are talking about uh, uh, disease and hospitals, and uh, maybe some people are talking about debt. No one is talking about energy limits, uh, and not too many people are talking about climate change either. So right now, unfortunately, we're not getting an emotional signal that we have biophysical limits because everything is so deflated in price. Um, but I think in the near future, we will have those signals again. And in the next few years, I think it will become obvious to more and more leaders that we will not be able to continue GDP as a mm -hmm. goal. And when that happens, in my opinion, we have to have models, pilots, research in place on alternatives to GDP. But many of the alternatives out there right now are just a bunch of economic and ecological statistics. And I think the, re the, the way we need to go is we will never change away from GDP to genuine progress indicator or a gross national happiness or something like that that is really a progressive uh, statistic and it's also, we didn't evolve to be happy. I mean, happiness was a byproduct of us pursuing the things that we uh, uh, pursued. So I think what we really need is a new um, metric where we interview thousands, tens of thousands of people on how they're experiencing their life, their health, their security, their knowledge, their access to information, their community, all those things into a new tabulation of how people are doing. And that will not be totally correlated with GDP. If you're very poor, it will be. If you're mm -hmm. middle class or above, it won't be. And so if we get those new metrics and maybe have communities around the world that are using those same questionnaires to measure how people are doing, then we might be able to, uh, in aggregate, shift away from GDP. But I think it, that's only going to happen after a, a, a descent begins. Yeah, you've got a lot of uh, research being done, experiments being done on uh, on other, like uh, metrics around happiness, and it was it was talked about a few a few years ago. Not so much right now. I, I would like to go back on the to see how you make sense of the current crisis. You know, you mentioned the fact that I mean, could it be? A game changer in terms of behavior because people are experimenting a different, uh, different habits. Or all a lot of people had saw, saw their habits being challenged and probably experimented something new, and that's for the behavior and the culture part. And I would like also to to touch on uh, the economics and debt because we see that this debt issue is. Clearly, you know, uh, it's nothing new, but it's 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 accelerating right now. So, uh, how do you make sense of it, and how do you see it uh, ending, basically? Yeah, well, I'll do the second question first, and if I forget your first question, come and remind me again. <clears throat> so, for the last twenty years, we've used the central banks of the world to replace the model of the commercial banks. So. For most people don't know that money comes into existence uh, as a loan in a commercial bank just because someone wants it and is credit worthy. So at that time, there is uh, an asset and a liability added to the bank and everything is neutral from an economic perspective. But from a biophysical perspective, there is more money in existence that is able to be spent on physical resources. Mm -hmm. So for the last 50 odd years, we've been adding more and more money and to our system. We've been spending that more and more on energy and natural resources. And when that becomes difficult and parts of the population can no longer afford to access resources, then we issue debt. We, the central banks of the world or the government, the treasuries issue more debt. And there's something called risk homeostasis, which says that if you do something risky, but nothing bad happens, you will compensate and do more of that thing, thinking that it's less risky. So we keep adding more and more debt and nothing really bad has happened. So we're using that as a model globally to consume more today by 
making those resources less available in the future. Oh, so it's global, like thinking as if we had two extra planets. Yes, two extra planets. So um, before this crisis, the world, uh, all the economies in the world had around three and a half times as much debt um, as the total size of our economy. So 350% debt to GDP. Now, with this coronavirus, our models say the global economy is likely to drop 15%. There's a chance it might only be 10%, but there's also a chance it might be over 20%. It depends how long we reopen and then the virus comes back and we have to shut down. Uh, it, it, it depends on a lot of variables. But let's say we drop 15% to 20%. To overcome that, to help people and businesses, we're going to have to add significantly more debt. So a year from now or two years from now, if we navigate this crisis, our debt to GDP is going to be 450% or 500%, um, which is truly unsustainable, but it's doable. We can do it now because Japan has done something similar. But what that means is, um, you know, in the United States, we just passed $24 trillion in uh, government debt. And I, in my opinion, we're going to have to do $8 trillion, $10 trillion more to get through this coronavirus crisis. That will never be paid back. We don't have the energy and resources to pay that back. So at some point in the next decade, we're going to face what I call a great simplification which is when our financial claims deflate down to uh, our energy and material uh, um, way of supporting them. And there's all sorts of systems and complexity involved in there. So I'm doing everything I can in the next few years to prepare society for a bend, but not a break. Because everyone talks about collapse and things like that, as if it were a binary thing, like mm -hmm. we're either going to grow or collapse. Well, there's a huge area in the middle where we decline in as measured by the energy and material use, but we may not ultimately decline in our health and well-being and social stability, but we need lots of different people working on what that looks like. And I, you know, I'm more on the leftward leaning spectrum, but a lot of my colleagues uh, in the United States who care about climate change and who care about sustainability, they think we can just choose to do that. Let's not bail out the energy companies. Let's uh, immediately put a carbon tax. Uh, let's choose to live more sustainably. Let's choose to do a steady state. It's not that simple. First of all, we need people from all political spectrums to agree. And second of all, there's this momentum of the system. There's this inertia of how much energy the, the, the mouths of the world need based on our current situation. And so paradoxically, uh, that superorganism paper that I think you read, and that's why you contacted me, I've been writing about how society needs to prepare for this great simplification when we're no longer able to kick a can using debt. But paradoxically, in the last month, I've been advising politicians that we actually need to issue more debt now to get through the next few months. Because right now, I can speak to my country. Uh, we have approaching 40 million people are unemployed there's a 50% of small businesses expect they might go out of business by the end of the year. We can't just have those people give them a little bit of help and have them go into more debt. We have to have the government take over the brunt of the damage from this crisis because we have two options. We can either have companies borrow more money, individuals borrow more money, and then we emerge from this crisis and they're all much weaker and we have a weaker economic engine. Or we can have the government support everything. And then when we emerge from this crisis, most people and businesses are in a similar state to February 2020. And I think like, that's... Like we, do, like we do in France. Yeah, like we do in France. Just so. I, I'm very worried about the United States. Canada's doing the right thing. France is doing the right thing. I mean, France, 
Europe has some problems because the the North and the South uh, yeah, sure. are going to have different responses. But the answer is the governments need to do more, and they can and they should. But it's a political issue. So um, yeah, debt. Uh, you know, since you and I have been alive, uh, the my country and yours have issued more debt every single year than than our economies have increased in those years. So it's like this snowball rolling downhill yeah. that we're blind to. We don't ever think about it. And you, you, you could argue also that if we had, we still had Bretton Woods, and we, if we still had uh, currency, you know, linked to some physics, some physical good, and we wouldn't be able to emit so much debt, and we wouldn't have been able to uh, to exploit the earth and the environment so much and we, we, we wouldn't be in that situation that's just speculating but there is a direct correlation with with how much debt is being emitted and therefore how much power we have to uh go out there and dig deeper and, and cut more things and and you know like fish more things uh, this is why we we i was talking about two extra planets because we're behaving as if we will have two extra planets to reimburse the debt somehow Right. I, 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 how do you see things um, ending? Because the debt thing, and this is this is a struggle to me because um, maybe we we still emit more debt, and we still because we still believe in debt, because we still believe somehow that yes, this will be refunded. There is a trust thing around that, right? This is all based on trust, and we know that. You know, money is based on trust. The whole system is based on trust. So the the debt thing stops when a lot of people involved in this stop trusting the system, right? And then therefore realize that, oh, maybe there is a link with energy, for example. The, that that's, that's how it happens because, or it can go on forever until we stop pretending that there is no correlation and, you know, we can emit debt for the next you know, 15 years, 20 years until we lose trust. How do you, it, what's it, your take on that trust thing? It can't go on forever um, because there is a, a physical uh, relationship underpinning it. Um, and you're right. Trust is the variable that's most important. Um, many countries have had debt crises before, like Argentina has happened many times uh, where they couldn't pay their debts and they had to, Reestablish nine, nine, nine a times, currency I think, yeah. in nine times, but it's never happened to the whole world, um, or at least not in in modern history. So that would be a very bad thing if people lost trust in currencies uh, or lost trust in in each other. Um, so yes, money. Um, there's there's kind of a game of musical chairs where there's 15 chairs, and when the music stops, there's going to be 10 chairs. And that's what we need to prepare for. Um, I think the trust is a very uh, central issue. And so I'm, I'm nervous about um, having everyone in the world aware of the, the fragility of our financial system. I mean, with respect to your very popular podcast, the people listening to this aren't probably going to tip the system into anarchy. Um, because, because the beliefs are so <laughs> strong in the, in the leadership, there are very, very strong personalities with e every single high level political official I've met, Julian, is directly flanked by either an MBA or an economist. And those people generally, uh, are, they're not bad people, but they've been following the wrong rule book over the last 50 or 60 years. They've mistaken this unbelievable advance in human prosperity with how special and clever we are when most of it was based on this powerful armies of laborers that we get from the ground. And so, uh, these, these belief systems die hard. And it will never change while they're in power and that while we're still growing. It will have to change after a crisis. And I think we're in the beginning of that crisis now. And so it will change not only with the minds of people, but also with the hearts. We can't lead this new movement by some renewable energy analysts saying, and we do this amount of wind turbines and then we'll be sustainable. I think it has to come from the artists, from the painters, from the storytellers that 
kind of start living differently and telling different stories. And then we get the technocrats involved on how to, how to arrange that. So I think there's all sorts of organic possibilities now that we have to start trying. Um, mm-hmm. so there's a, there's a top down. The government needs to support people full stop, but there's a bottom up that people might need to start doing things differently. And that starts with an audience of one. I mean, I've changed some of my own behaviors and I try to teach my students that the best things in life are free and spend a lot of time in nature and those sorts of things. But it's these cultural narratives take uh, 10 or 20 years yeah. to to happen and we don't have that amount of time. Yeah, and to, and to quote Spinoza again, like you, you can only change what people desire by greater desire. So there's something about building something that's desirable uh, versus you know s- making people scared or asking them to change because we have to. I guess we, that's the only way. And and Parce- to go back to the fr- yeah, sorry, go for. Parce que petit à petit l'oiseau fait son nid. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> step by step. Um, yeah, I was asking the, the the question related to also behavior. Um, on what has happened, what's happening right now with the, with this virus. Uh, how do you see the culture being impacted by this? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. In my country, I think you're having and will continue to have this bifurcated response where some people like me, they're working from home. I have a garden. I live with my dogs. Things are not so bad. I'm not traveling. I go to the grocery store once a week. This is a mini vacation. For a lot of people, this is a disaster. They have no money coming in. They have no savings. They're very worried. They're very anxious. There's no joy in society right now. I went to the grocery store two days ago, and people were a little bit like zombies. There was not a carefree uh, attitude. So I think there's a psychological pall over our nation. And, uh, but it's, it's bifurcated. And I think as we go through this, you're going to see, uh, the haves and the have nots. The distinction is going to widen. And I think we're going to, in your country, well, in France, uh, in Italy, in Spain, in the United States, we are in the next five years going to have massive amounts of poor people. Um, and hopefully, Uh, these communities will self-organize and start to do things differently. And hopefully the wealthier people uh, with resources in those communities will give something back and try to rebuild ecological restoration or little social projects involving the teenagers in their towns. But I, I, I think we, we're going to have very large antagonism towards the rich in coming years. And I think even though, um, It's not the fault of the rich. It's the fault of the system. I think this time around, there's going to be some what we call in the U.S. perp walks, which is they're going to choose some people to take the blame for what happened in the financial industry because all this cheap money and and uh, uh, debt in the last 10 years went into stock buybacks so that we enriched the CEOs, yeah. but didn't really c- create productivity. The, there, there was anger about that in 2008. Now I think it's going to go beyond anger. Um, so I think people are hopeful that this is going to end. And But unfortunately, like in my state in Wisconsin, last night the governor, uh, the, the Supreme Court just said, No, the lockdown is unconstitutional. Wisconsin opens today. And so I think some people are too afraid to go out and change. But a lot of people will go out and do things. And in two or three weeks, we're going to have a spike in cases. Yeah. And and then once we have a second wave and people realize that this isn't over yet, that's when the psychological toll is going to start to happen, which is why I'm working with policymakers to expand the government support for for individuals and businesses because there's no other way you mentioned it you know some people believe that um this can collapse and and we were talking about this before we started recording but you are aware aware that in france there is a a movement that is called collapsology uh which is related to the fact that um 
the theory that a lot of people actually are, are into are into this more and more the fact that everything could fall down and that all the systems uh, as it's working right now could stop and more more or less progressively but that is that this is kind of inevitable what's your take on this movement because you know a little bit about this and do you have the equivalent in the US Yeah, well, I think anyone that's paying attention to these issues and is fluent in how things fit together and is honest has to admit that there is a chance of collapse. And collapse could be absolutely horrible. Um, like Mad Max, nuclear plants going critical, tearing down forests, etc. I just don't think it's as likely as most people think. Uh, because there's a momentum of, of humans self-organizing around energy. If I had to put a percentage chance, I would say maybe 20% chance. I think it's far more likely, 90% likely, that we will bend and then figure something out. Um, for example, on renewables, right now, we could, if we wanted to, use excess solar and wind production. If we overbuild, we could use the excess near water to use hydrolysis to create fossil fuels to create heavy fuels, but that would cost $10 US per gallon when fossil gasoline costs $1 per gallon. So we would never do that based on a market system. But if we had some sort of a plan, we have the technology to extend our energy capacity into the future. We biophysically can do that. So I think it's, it's governance and getting many more pro-social, pro-future people seeing the correct picture and working on it. And right now we're getting this bullshit narrative that things are just going to grow and all we need to do is get rid of the bad energy and put in the good energy. Or there's nothing we can do. It's going to collapse. So, uh, in answer to your second question, um, We don't really have a collapsology movement in the United States. We have what's called preppers, which are people that are worried about Armageddon and they have uh, guns and gold and Bitcoin and beans and they, they're preparing for an apocalypse. Uh, but that's kind of always existed. And I think there's more people in that. But my view on that is, you know, one person surviving in such a world isn't going to help? What if you break your leg and you don't have a doctor? Yeah. We're going to have to all get through this together somehow. So my, you know, my biggest advice is get to know people in your, in your neighborhood, in your community, talk to people that you disagree with politically, but you agree on, you want a healthy uh, environment for your child. Uh, you want a peaceful neighborhood. You want to have a brewery or a, a winery. Uh, the things that every human likes We have to agree on those. But I firmly believe in my country, what's lacking most is the social nodes of communication, that the, 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 the webbing of our social infrastructure is so fractured because people just stay in their houses and they uh, go to their own echo chambers on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, yeah. only seeing the things that they agree with. Chacun voit midi à sa porte. Uh, so I, I don't know how... Uh, to get through that other than go and knock on people's doors and introduce yourself and say, we're in some tough times. Uh, my name is Je m'appelle Nate. And, and you, yeah. you build social capital out because all future, uh, uh, pathways are going to require less energy and material and more social capital. You know, here's, here's an example. When I was in Ecuador, I hiked in the cloud forest and I went to a remote village that everyone was living in these very simple adobe huts. And the richest family in this village, they were only rich because they had one set of fresh, clean clothes extra. And that was the only thing that differentiated them from all the other villagers, is they had an extra set of clothing. And yet they were given respect and they were looked up on and they felt like they were rich yet compared to the average Frenchman or American, they were all yeah. unbelievably poor. So I think when we go into this energy economic descent, we're going to have this feeling of loss that's going to dominate for a while. 
There's something called loss aversion in economics that if you start with $10,000 and you make 1,000, so you're up to 11,000 and they measure your brain, you have this happiness. And then if you go from 11,000 down to 10,000 where you started, they measure your brain, the, the negative sensations are much more intense than the positive sensations on the way up. That's what's going to happen to society is we're going to feel this feeling of loss. But then after a while, hopefully a short while, we look around and everyone else is going to be in our same situation. Mm. That's when humans thrive is when we have a shared challenge locally and we get through that. And if that could happen on a larger scale as we stair steps down and maybe navigate towards alternative GDP and using more uh, renewable energy to forestall energy descent. Yep. I mean, th that's the general direction. But you touch on, on many different things here. There is the, the topic of inequality. Uh, there is the topic of uh, the fact that you, we all live in our you know, information bubbles, our own reality. And we all, not all, not all countries and all uh, populations are equal. You've got you know, countries like the US where you've gone very, very far. Like uh, you don't even walk in the streets in most cities and you stay in your car. And you don't you know, like, uh, really get to, to meet uh, physically a lot of people. And everyone has a weapon, etc. Um, but in other countries, are as you just mentioned, you still have a social bump, um, social link that are, that exists, and uh, people spend time with their with their family, with their elders, etc. Still, you could argue that globally we are in that situation much more than a few years ago, where um, there is much more inequality. There is much more, uh, it's much more difficult than before to, uh, to listen to each other. We've got so much information coming to us. You know, like you see what's happening everywhere, you know, like people just shout at each other online and uh, are very fixed on their position. So it's kind of, we have this setup, which is, uh, we have this situation that is one of the most challenging we've ever had for you know the climate change is coming and we're gonna it's, it's here and with, with the consequences that are inevitable plus the, the decrease in energy plus that situation where we probably have a lot of the wrong leaders and the wrong setup so i would like to touch on on to go back to that great simplification and uh, and how do we handle that you know we've got it's the perfect storm mm -hmm. Well, we handle it uh, both from the top down and the bottom up, um, and we have to hope we have the right leaders who are educated and aware. In the United States right now, we have no leadership at all. Uh, I, I noticed. And, <laughs> yeah, and th that's almost as big of a problem as all these other things we're talking about because mm -hmm. we need people to trust the government, and the government needs to be capable of using science. I mean – Science isn't perfect, but science is better than bullshit. And uh, a lot of the things we're doing just make no sense. So we need better governance. And unfortunately, this, this era of huge economic surplus has self-selected for sociopathic leaders that mm -hmm. are their proximate goal is to help society in the future, but their ultimate goal is to help themselves. And in the future, when things are tougher, And that's true on the national level. On the local level, that's not so true. Local level, there are really great leaders in a lot of places. But I think we need to head for an era where people are like, I don't want to, I don't want to be the politician. I don't want to lead. Uh, but I guess I have to because no one else will do it. I will sacrifice my next two years okay. to help society sort of thing. And then on the bottom, we, we need different. Uh, leadership examples as individuals and communities that are doing things differently. And we have a very limited amount of time. So, so many people are just passive waiting for things to happen. We need to try stuff now. Um, and we need, if you have resources, you need to help people in your community. Um, keep the community tightly knit. Go back down to basics instead of luxury items. Uh, invest in hoop houses and greenhouses and Don't plan in your community to build new roads or a new airport. Put that money into protecting the land to, to grow food, um, to have a more uh, uh, prepare for a world that's a little bit smaller again. Because I think one of the, um, the externalities of this COVID crisis is at a minimum, all countries are aware of how 
uh, um, sensitive their supply chains are to globalization. In my country, a hundred percent of high blood pressure medicine, the precursors are made in China. That won't continue. We will do something to localize supply chains of key goods. And as that happens, the, the, the magnitude of our, you know, globalized commerce system will become more regional and local. And that, that will build resilience in the system, but it's going to cost more to do that. So things that are important to us, um, might be more available, but they're going to cost two or three times as much, which maybe might make us appreciate them more. I don't know. You know, Julian, it's such a huge story and I I don't know. (laughs) I, I really don't know the answer. I'm just hopeful that we have such a high level starting point that if we decline, if we have a great simplification, for instance, and GDP in the developed nations drops 30%, that would bring us back to 1995 level of GDP per capita. If we drop 50%, it brings us to 1970. So it doesn't have to be a disaster, but it has to be somehow thought through. And the more people we have that are living kind of a uh, simpler lives where they get their brain transmitters the way our ancestors got them, our brain neurotransmitters, our feelings, by social capital and natural capital and going out in nature and doing things instead of taking an air trip or a cruise, the more people that are comfortable and happy doing that and healthy, the, 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 that spreads. Uh, so I don't know if the collapsology people in France are doing those behaviors or if they're just watching this like a movie and they're, they're, no, no, it's, yeah, no, it, no it's, uh, you've got another movement which is close to what you mentioned, which is survi- so survivalist, like so people getting ready for survival. But it's, I think it's pretty tiny. I think the, the, the people that we call, um, collapsologue in France are, uh, also thinking kind of philosophically about these things and, and so it's, and, and mentioning the fact that it's about getting ready for this, building up new, being, uh, building up communities, you know, helping each other, building resilience. Uh, so it's not very negative. It's like, it's, it's more movement that says, okay, that's going to happen somehow. So it's not necessarily a very bad thing. It could be something different in India and better. But we need to get ready for that. It's kind of more, uh, um, yeah, it's a... Well, it's, uh, here's another example. So um, psycho- psychologists have observed that when people see an altruistic act being performed, someone helping someone else, they're much more likely to do an altruistic act themselves. We have great imaginations, but our imaginations are much more powerful when we have a direction for the imagination. So we need to see positive examples of things happening, and that gives us ideas of what we could do ourselves. So when we just read about collapse or energy descent, and we're going to have to use less energy and the debt will uh, not be available, those are just all abstractions. We need to actually see physical something happening. So we need to populate the world with those positive examples. And then that will kind of like pay it forward. That will spread because we need to, we need to see something concretely. We can't just imagine it on our own. Uh, so yeah. I think that's, that's very important, which is why I think Hollywood yeah. needs to get involved in this storytelling because the stories we hear from Hollywood right now are either we're going to colonize Mars because we're so freaking smart. Or we're going to have brain-eating zombies. And there's not a, not a lot of stuff in between. Like, we're going to have to use half as less energy, but we're still pretty cool. We have music and sex and invention, but we're using a lot less material throughput. We need to make that articulated as a viable pathway to give lots more people examples of how they can change in their lives. Yeah, it's 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 be able to to create to foresee something that that's desirable, and uh, I, actually in French in, in that community you have a lot of people that are saying this and working on this. You know, making how you imagine something that's desirable, and uh, a lot of people get it. And uh, that's also something that's very cool, very difficult for for me, for example, because once you start talking about these topics, 
um, it's very easy to to get trapped into the negative. Yeah, and for uh, sure. and and making everyone scared. You know, you talk about these topics at a dinner. Of course, you want to make the point, and you you go into this and you say that's fucking happening, etc. And so, and, and people don't follow up because they don't want to hear these stories. So, right. and also to yourself, you know, you be, you can become very easily a little bit uh, depressed, etc. So, so yeah. I, I guess. Um, well, and I think I think there is a really valid uh, um, or understandable behavior there that when people find out about the magnitude of this story, they're they seek to tell others because it provides them comfort. I feel this burden. Yeah. And if I share it with my friend, Fred, Fred's going to feel shitty. And when Fred feels shitty, I'm going to feel a little bit better. And it's kind of this <laughs> odd dynamic, uh, which isn't all that productive. So, but right now yeah. we don't sound crazy anymore, Julian. The things that you've been thinking and, and talking about are happening now in the real world. So now is the time to have. A robust, honest, authentic conversation with people about what we really face, because that's the only chance is if we get five to 10% of the most creative pro future humans collectively working on the real game board in front of us instead of some delusional one where we can get rid of all fossil fuels and continue to grow. I mean, so we need to get yeah. more people working on the real story. What's your take on you mentioned a little bit on this, but on the on the role of leaders? Uh, you, you talked about political leaders, but do you have a point of view on business leaders? Because of course, um, you've got a lot of people that are in a position of power with a huge impact, and as we mentioned before, like these people are kind of forced to grow their the business. And right. uh, how do you so, do? What, what's your take on that? Well, my take on that is we like to blame corporations for our problems and the CEO oh, oh, the of system this, capitalism yeah the you're right capitalism is just a, a biological outcropping of a optimal foraging theory uh, a optimal foraging species combined with a large energy surplus and we self-organized around that and we called it capitalism so as we have less energy I don't know that capitalism will uh, continue to exist at least not in its current form. But corporations aren't the problem. It's the structure that's empowering the corporations that's the problem. So if there's a bad CEO who's an asshole and he gets kicked out, they're just going to hire another CEO to follow the same rules. So eventually we, uh, you know, in the 19th century, there was an economist named Thorstein Veblen who made an important distinction between business and industry. And business was what we might conventionally call uh, the fire sector, finance, invest, insurance, real estate. Uh, but industry was making shoes and food and supply chains and schools. And so I think in the coming decade, we're going to have to use that distinction and focus on industry uh, and basic goods and important things and business represented by finance. You know, right now, the what's happening, at least in my country, and to some extent in yours, is the central banks are guaranteeing all these bonds. Yeah, and so same. the response is it's, it's encouraging gambling in the market. For example, Boeing just doubled their debt. Now, Boeing has got a really uh, vulnerable business model going forward because they make airplanes and people aren't going to be flying as much. They're not going to have as much money. So the airline business is going to be at risk. Yet Boeing doubled their total debt at a, at a interest rate of four and a half percent, and now all these people are buying those Boeing bonds at four and a half percent because they know the Federal Reserve is going to guarantee them. I think it would be better if those companies don't go into more debt, but that the government actually takes an equity stake in those companies, mm -hmm. and so when this crisis is over, Boeing isn't burdened with extra debt and and weakened. But my point is that we are continuing to use the central banks to paper over our problem and financial assets. Ultimately, I have no idea about the next week or month or six months, but in the next decade, it is a certainty that financial assets are going to significantly deflate relative to the real economy. And that can happen and it would be okay, except a lot of rich people would be less rich 
as long as we still focus on the industry, is still all the factories and the expertise and the supply chains exist to give people the things that they need in life, instead of measuring our success as a species where the Dow Jones or the FTSE uh, or the CAC Courant is uh, every day. But is there a transition or something that these still like these people within these organizations can 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 do about it you know because i there is so much blame on uh on on these companies and maybe and they're part of the problem how much are they part of the solution if as long as the system doesn't change well i think there's we have to be careful because i think there's a short-term problem and it's an immediate urgent problem we have to successfully navigate this coronavirus crisis without it destroying the economic engine. We already have a decline. We don't want to stop the engine from working because it will never restart. Then we have a longer term problem, which is limits to growth, inequality, and what are our cultural aspirations? So we have to solve these things sequentially. And I think in that longer term problem, if we change cultural aspirations away from GDP, then, then we, we change the rules for corporations and those same bright, ambitious people who are running these corporations might make different decisions based on, based on that. But right now they can't because yeah. our whole system is geared around profits. Yeah. As we say, you, you can't be the only one not playing the game. No, well, then you just be rules. fired. Yeah. If they don't play the game, they'll be fired mm, or bankrupt. Uh, right. we're getting to, to the end. Like, what should we, what should we tell our children? You know, what should we teach them? And how do you tell the the story of the of the world? I've got two young daughters. I'm always wondering. You know, when I read these books about the you know that I've been reading when I was uh, when I was younger, and the world is so different, and and the the future is so different from what I what I was you know thinking. I can't make sense of it. I don't know if you have a take on. How old are your daughters? Uh, three and one, so still very young, but still it's a generic question on, uh, yeah, but, but uh, your daughters may be at the perfect age that they, they may never be old enough to, uh, experience the, the chaos of the next five or seven years. But by the time they're 10 years old, we might've already navigated into a, a, a more sane, slower economy and they might just have amazing lives because they've, they didn't grow up during during this you know 2020 yeah but still we, you already need to talk about certain you know values or you oh, know, as a sure. par as a parent you have some you know things that, that you imagine yeah you go to university or you'll develop that skill or it's important to learn that etc I, I know if you have to take a yeah, very more personal well, question but... take. i mean I, I i teach uh 18 and 19 year olds at the university of minnesota um and I think the, the we ha part of this problem is our education system, and part of it is parenting because we were just ignorant about the larger ecological backdrop. I don't have kids; I have dogs. But if I had kids, I would teach them uh, about nature, about ecology. I would teach them about all these things that I know, not the scary things, but just about the brain, what makes us happy, about ecology, where does uh, how does uh, animals get their food. I would teach them that uh, these things are uh, have an intense ability to hijack our brains and that they're not healthy. And I would probably limit the screen time to my kids, because if we give a 12 year old an iPhone mentally, that is identical to giving them cocaine. It's the exact same neural mechanisms. And we give that to our children and our teenagers. And then when they get to college age, their their um uh their attention spans are so so short that they wouldn't be able to plant tomato garden or or do things that that require a long attention span so i would actually really limit uh access to that sort of technology and spend as much time out in nature and as much time with uh other kids their age so that they build uh social maybe long lasting bonds with other humans um but, you know, th there is uh, a, a seriousness about this that I, I think I can't tell the whole truth of how I see things to someone who's 14 or 15 because I think it's too much. 
So my class called Reality 101 is, is college freshmen, sophomore juniors, and they're, they're ready to hear it. But somehow I do think we need to shift the education system so that these issues about energy and ecology and human behavior are taught earlier. For instance, this evolutionary psychology stuff that I really think is important in my country, there is no way we could teach that in the high schools because the parents would call the principal. What are you telling about evolution and the brain? Maybe in France or in Hong Kong, you could. But here, that's a non-starter. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you, you know what to teach your kids. Yeah, yeah. About about real human values. You read Spinoza. I mean, the 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 best things in life are free and we know what's right and wrong. We've just been distracted at this unbelievably tasty and novel and colorful smorgasbord for the last 30 years. And we know that that's kind of an illusion deep down. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, you know, it's going to be a lot more physical work um than than we have. Uh well, we're going to have a lot, I, yeah. I guess there is a lot about learning to to avoid all these uh, um, these donuts, you know, like all these uh, all these things, as you mentioned, that are that are getting us getting us away from a certain sense of reality. Yeah, distractions. That's the word I was I was talking about. I was thinking about. Yeah. The last question. Or donuts. Donuts too donuts. are distracting. <laughs> <laughs> distracting to me. Uh, what are the two books? Uh, this is the question I asked to all my guests. What are the two or three books that you would recommend everyone to read to uh, to live in the 21st century or at least to, to go through the next you know, 10, 15 years? Any type of books? Um, there's so many books, Julian. Uh, I've got two books. One is about to be finished called Reality Blind. And the other one is on Amazon. It's called The Bottlenecks of the 21st Century, which explains a lot of the things I've, I've talked about. Uh, there's so many books on brain and behavior, on ecology, on energy. I, it would be very hard for me to uh, um, start with two of them. Uh, Herman Daly has written a lot that I find really helpful But I think, you know, all the building blocks of the collapsology story, books that were written in the last 20 years, I don't think many synthesize everything together. Like uh, Yuval Har Harari, uh, uh, Sapiens, and De Homo, Homo Deus, those books were brilliant. I agreed with everything in them, except he also is energy blind. The one thing missing from those books is there was nothing about the energetic underpinnings of civilization. Uh, so yeah, my, my books are the two books and they're, they're, they're almost done. <laughs> okay. Well, th th thank you so much, Nate. That was an amazing conversation to me. Don't react, that, will be, that will be pleasing to, um, to the people watching it or listening to it. Well, we're, we're alive at an amazing time and this is a time where we can make a difference. And uh, I invite your listeners to, to think about this and to, to participate somehow in our future, because all of us can participate and that's going to look differently for everyone. That's a good takeaway. Thanks. Okay. A bientôt. None of this is rhetoric and none of it is hysteria. It is fact. 